I'm Dave Meinhard with the Vatacuti Foundation in Detroit. And the Vatacuti Foundation, I've been with them for about 10 years. Before that, I was in the TV news business as a cameraman. But I have learned so much about you know the world of robotic surgery and medicine with my association with the foundation. Uh, joining us today, we have our CEO, Dr. Mahendra Bhandari. But a little more about the Vatacuti Foundation. It was founded over 20 years ago with Raj and Padma Vatakuti when they decided to give back to society and they do things in philanthropy that no one else has done and they've been recognized as being a driving force behind funding the very first robotic surgery program in the world and that was at the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. There are other robotic surgery work going on around the world and other in countries and other hospitals, but Dr. Monty Menon formed the very first program designed around robotic surgery and urology specifically. And thanks to the funding of the Vatacuti Foundation and the work of Dr. Menon and his team, they were able to develop the very first real successful use for the da Vinci robots in urology for the robotic prostatectomy. And it made things much better for men as far as recovering and with less scarring, a lot less pain. And it's then translated from not just urology to many other specialties that could also use robotics. And so it's just a little bit about it, but for, for over 20 years, they've been funding research and training doctors mainly in India, but they have partners around the world. And today we're not going to be focused on robotic surgery, although robotic surgery is used with living organ donation and some cadaveric donation, I would assume. It is also, you know, one of those things that we're going to not look at closely, but look at organ donation. And organ donation is something that, you know, different parts of the world do more or less. And it's an important thing, especially cadaveric donation, because a dead body, if they still have useful organs, they can be donated to somebody and change their life. And I have people I know that have been fortunate enough to receive a, an organ and it made them have life that they would not have had. So let's go ahead and let's, I'm going to introduce my boss, Dr. Mahendra Bhandari. He's the CEO of the Vatikuti Foundation and he will begin the program now. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm sorry about the little delay, but it looks like we're all, all ready to go. Uh, so, Neil, thank you, Dave, for this brief intro. As Dave said, the Vatikuti Foundation has changed the gear to a broader perspective of uh, from robotic surgery. Our mandate is to educate people, educate masses, educate. We have been involved with educating surgeons at different levels. And uh, this is a subject very close to my heart uh, because that was one of my subspecialties which I practiced. And uh, uh, I couldn't have found a better person than Dr. Shroff who has done such a human service to the organization of cadaveric organ program in country. I think most of you know that there is a global paucity of organs and there are lots of nefarious activities to compensate for that. And that was a very difficult step to combat. So I'll put a contrast to what Dr. Shroff is going to talk. It is 15 years I left India for the United States, but I'm in very much in India and uh, how things have changed over a period of time. It was 1988 when uh, we decided to establish uh, a new institute from nothing at Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute. And I was one of the five chairmen of the department who started the whole thing with the building and there was nothing there. And we had dreams of establishing uh, urology and kidney transplant particularly more than the dream, our expectations from these institutions were extremely high. Because 84, it was established, but 89 only it could pick up. It could really have a formal opening with uh, 
no infrastructure. And it was difficult to think of starting a program there. And, um, but we had a wonderful team in Vijay Kher, Anant Kumar, Rajesh Ailavat, uh, Rakesh Kapoor, the best people who were there. And Anant Kumar was specifically, uh, myself had, uh, was part of the first program in the country at CMC Velour during my training. But uh, there was no infrastructure, and we were still toying with uh, um, that. Oh, let gamma cameras come and this, and we will meet weekly. But no, nothing because we had a pessimist group who said that it's a 120 million population. They population they haven't seen a transplant. So if we fail, then we fail the state because then it would be hard to establish. And so Neil will remember that was the time of Willy Wacom when the, India was known for bad regions, uh, uh, that we were the biggest uh, organ selling and buying market in South. And this is one credit line for Sunil that he has changed the begin from a state which was so notorious for organ donation. Uh, at that time, uh, we were still, I think it was 89 in July 6, July 89. and. Uh, 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 we had planned to do it by the end of the year, and we had a lot of patients on dialysis and all. And I had been traveling a lot, so I came from Ahmedabad and went to operate, and as I did my first patient, there was a noise outside the operating the theater that uh, somebody's dead, somebody's dead, and we didn't have emergency, so he was brought to operation theater, and the anesthesia people revived a 19-year-old man who had come to neurosurgery OPD from Kanpur to uh, get a ch checkup for head injury and he dropped dead there. And uh, we revived him, he was brain dead. Now, it's a whole long lot of story. There was no cadaveric law at that time. There was no law to take organ from the person, but uh, we had a will and we worked out the things and uh, we convinced the father, Anand Kumar took the lead of convincing the father and we took, and this was perhaps the first program in the country. We started with a cadaveric organ and uh, not fully prepared. And the, that set the ball for this. And thereafter, my mission was, I think I must have delivered hundreds of lectures promoting cadaveric organ transplant in the society, wherever it is. And then I learned that there are two places Indians learn. One of them is politicians and another is the religious gurus. So I went to religious gurus and explained to them whether they can find a parallel. And then let me tell you, it's a story of success as well as failure. We continued to try to get cadaveric organs from uh, the, because we didn't have a trauma center, but from King George's Medical University, but we were not able to successful. Only we did another um, two kidneys from another gentleman uh, and that's it. So it was such a difficult time to give a context to what Dr. Shroff is going to present. Without wasting too much of time, I will let my good friend Sunil to take over. At the end, Sunil, after your talk, I would like to bring in uh, Dr. Bandari, who is principal, I wrote, but probably he's busy with something. So uh, we will give uh, access to Shivan, Dr. Shivam Priyadarshi, who you know. And uh, this is the largest hospital, my alma mater, uh, uh, which I was dreaming to have a transplant. But recently they have started a cadaveric organ program. And that would be in context to say and listen to them how did they overcome the barrier to set a similar example in the country? So Sunil, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bandari. Very kind of you to have given such an excellent introduction. I have, uh, you know, you're right. You know, we have had the best of practices and the worst of practices as far as our donation is concerned. And over the next half an hour, I hope to cover these areas, aspects. And uh, you know, we also try to keep it a little bit of, you know, keep it a little interactive so that you know we keep the audience engaged. Just to tell you that I have no financial disclosures, and the few pictures which are sourced are from the net, and, and I have duly acknowledged. Thank you.
I'm going to talk about organ donation and transplantation as Dr. Wright said, how it saves lives, how it transforms lives. And I'm going to try and cover you know, a little bit about everything in the next half an hour, which is not really easy, but let's see how we go. So let's do an audience poll first. So we have a mix that's interesting. Western doctors, senior doctors, hospital staff, paramedical, 28%, still happening. No consumers, others, I'm not sure what others are. So we have a mix, that's good. So I think still polling. All right, so, so we have the maximum is hospital staff and paramedics, great. So let's go, go with my talk. So I can accordingly, you know, stress certain things and leave other things. Thank you so much for doing this. So the story of organ donation and transplantation started in 1950s. When the first kidney transplant happened in the world. And this is Joseph Murray doing the first kidney transplant between identical twins in Brigham Hospital in Boston. And this was done without an immunosuppressive agent. He was a plastic surgeon. I read his biography and I'm totally inspired by this gentleman. And he says, service to society is the rent we pay for living on this planet. So we are hugely inspired by him. I'm going to cover three areas. First, I'm going to talk about the concepts of organ donation, then the challenges and barriers in this program, and solution to improve organ donation. The story, of course, obviously, I'm since I'm from India, I'm going to be using India as an example, but this applies to everywhere. This is our god of transplantation. He is called Lord Ganesh. He's a deity, very, you know, most of the Indian. Gods and our deities are very handsome, but he's a little bit abnormal. And we are, there are some parallels here. You know, he's very podgy. You know, he's got this central obesity. And we say that he must be on steroids, because if you're on steroids after transplant, you get central obesity. He likes sweets, he's a laddu. And after if you're on steroids, you like sweets. And we have this mouse here, you know, most of our research is done mouse. So he's truly a god of transplantation. Let me start by saying who can donate organs and tissue. You can have a live donor and disease donor. You can have live related, live unrelated, mostly related. Disease donor after death it can be after natural death or it can be after brain. So this is your spectrum of your organ donor. So anybody can donate something or the other. A living person can donate one kidney, part of the liver, and these days also uterus transplants. After death, after natural death, you can donate your eyes, skin, heart valves, bone, veins, and so on. After brain death, you can recycle your whole body. Almost anything and everything can be donated. Almost eight solid organs, which can save eight lives and up to 50 issues, tissues. You can enhance 50 other lives, right? You know, saving many lives. Brain death, what is brain death? In India, unfortunately, we have very good traffic accidents. We estimate there are 95,000 brain dead, you know, donors any given year, which makes our rate very high. It's a very unfortunate circumstance. So they are young people, and the only positive outcome of these deaths is probably organ donation. We have a life lost every 3.7 minutes of course in India, unfortunately, and this is not changed. Halil Gibran is a very famous American Lebanese poet, and I like his words about this applies very well to organ donation. He says, you give but little when you give of your possessions that is your wealth, is when you give of yourself that you truly give, and this is the story of our brain. You need to give a part of yourself. Brain death happens usually, as I said, in a road traffic accident, when there's a trauma to the head, when there's a bleeding within the brain, you know, when we are, you know, the brain is enclosed by skull, so the blood doesn't, is not able to expand and it squeezes the brain, and I'll show you a picture, like a cartoon soon. It can also happen due to a tumor in the brain or stroke due to ischemia. And these patients are in intensive care units, mostly on medical care, and their perfusion of blood supply to the brain is gone. And to live, 
you need to you need the brain to breathe and to do your essential functions. And the brain needs glucose and oxygen every second. If it's deprived of this, the cells die. This is a quick cartoon to show you what brain death is. So I want this concept to be very clear. So the brain needs constant supply of blood, as I said. So once there is a head injury, there's increase, the bleeding happens and there's increase in pressure inside the brain and it strangles the brain literally. And it squeezes it to make it completely devoid of the supply. And as your lungs and heart are kept going, and this is what is brain dead. This has happened because of intensive care, you know, has improved. And we have recognized this condition. This was recognized in 1958-59 in Paris. It was called Beyond Coma. And in 1968, the Harvard Medical School came out with the criteria for brain death. In this situation, as I said, all the tissues can be donated, including composite tissues like hand. This is a young girl in, you know, she lives in Pune in India, and she was traveling to her, you know, college, which was in Mangalore, and she had an accident in the bus, and she lost her hands, and then she underwent hand transplant three years after her, after her, you know, hands got amputated. By that, she had bilateral upper arm forearm hand transplantation. And she's one of the greatest ambassadors for us today from our world. These are these hand transplants, you know, which you do, there are other tissues also we can transplant similarly. These are called composite allo transplants and they include muscle, skin, bone, vessels, and nerves in this case, and hand transplantation. So similarly, you can have face transplants, uterus, larynx, and, you know, things like penis. These are another type of transplant which happens. If somebody wants to wish to donate the Eyes of your loved ones, sorry. You need to keep the eyes moist, use a wet, wet cotton swab, keep the eyes it's closed, avoid using a fan over the body, contact the nearest eye bank, and it only takes 10 minutes for the doctor or technician to perform the procedure. Anybody can donate some organs. These can be donated, and these are all native age groups. We've also had these from 80 years old, 85 years old. So anybody from newborn to 80 years old, heart can be donated up to 60 years, Lungs again up to 60 years, liver up to 70 years, and so on. So something can be donated by anyone, in, irrespective of whether they have diabetes, hypertension, or whatever. Anybody can donate. And really no age bar as such. After donation, the solid organs, the critical organs, need to try be transplanted in a very short time. Once you take out and to transplant within six hours, lungs, same thing with heart, four to six hours, liver has to be taken out and transplanted within 12 hours. Pancreas, usually 24 hours. Kidneys can be kept up to 48 hours a night. So you can't store organs forever. They need to be transplanted. Issues can be stored for living long. If there is a death at home, but you know, if you want to donate, one thing which you need to remember is you need to have a conversation with your next of kid, your family member, because they need to give consent for organ donation when something untowards happens. If there's a death at home, eyes or corneas or skin can be donated. If there is death in hospital, then you can donate after natural death. This is called donation after celebrity death, in natural death. That also is happening now. Or after brain death, all organs can be donated. Our, you know, Ravindar Tagore, who's a Nobel laureate from India, and he said something about, which is interesting to read. Death is not extinguishing the light, but putting out a lamp because the dawn has come. And this dawn is the dawn of organ donation. And I just want to tell you, why should you consider organ donation in your lives? In India on 26th of December, 2004, we had this huge tsunami, which killed almost 12,000 people, if you please. Okay. It killed 12,000 people. And you will wonder why I'm talking about tsunami talk. Because every year, you know, we in India, we have almost 200,000 people who suffer from kidney disease. And, we, and many die, and we don't even talk about this. And it's not tsunami. I call it the kidney disease a silent tsunami, but it just doesn't give you any warning. It just comes and strikes you. Why this is so high? The kidney disease has gone up. It is estimated that human, human, human you know, rationally, 
one in 10 person will have some problem with the kidney. And many will end up requiring a transplant or you know, some kind of replacement therapy. This is happening because there's an increased lifestyle disease incidence like diabetes. In Southeast Asians, diabetes is five times the rate of white population. Hypertension is very common, again, among the Asians especially. And this may be due to diet and also access to healthcare being very less as far as Southeast Asian country people are concerned. And there's an ever-growing requirement for transplant. This is a waiting list from US. And you see close to this is a waiting list for our lines, the old slide. Today, the waiting list is even higher. We have a waiting list of almost 130,000 people waiting on our problem. And we only do 28,000 odd organ transplants. So the gap is widening every day. And there are more and more patients waiting for transplant. It's said that 20 people in a day die waiting for an organ. The same is the story with heart failure lungs, you have pulmonary fibrosis, you have direct COVID lungs, this COVID pandemic, you have non, you know, uh, alcoholic, you know, fatty livers causing, you know, a lot of liver failures. We have type 1 diabetes which requires pancreas and kidney transplants and as I showed you, amputees who require hand transplants. There's a huge requirement. And to overcome this organ shortage and, you know, sort of take care of this imbalance between supply and demand, we need to look at various factors to you know, help this whole organ donation move. We need to, on one side, increase the donor pool. This requires early identification and certification of brain death. It requires you know, kidney exchange programs, which is now happening, which is taking care of 10 to 15% of transplants in countries like US. We need to improve our consent rates. The families need to be supported in their decision to donate by trained people, by trained counselors. We need to improve efficiency of organ utilization and distribution. And of course, we need to reduce our lifestyle diseases so that we can reduce the incidence of kidney disease. And I'm going to cover most of these areas as we go forward. So another audience poll I want to do, to overcome organ shortage, we should allow the sale of organs like kidney. Yes, no, not sure. This is what Dr. Bandari was talking about, the bad practices of organ donation. No, 100% so far. Yes, 25, not sure, 8%. Let's see where it lands up to us. This is important. Get a view. But there is today very, many people, many even doctors who feel that we should allow sale of organs to take care of our shortage. So there is a percentage of people here who, can we stop the poll, please? Let me go on to my brother. Let me tell you what's the problem with sale of kidneys. There are two types of consent process in organ donation. There's an opt-in and opt-out. Opt-in is when the consent is taken from the list of kin for organ donation. And there's an opt-out, where the state presumes that the person has given consent for organ donation unless they have expressed otherwise on its registry from the state. So here the state takes the responsibility. And there are countries who have high organ donation rate, especially for disease donation. And this includes countries like Spain, Croatia, France, Belgium, and recently United Kingdom has taken up opt-out uh, policy for our donation to overcome our shortage. But we find that this happens predominantly in countries where you have a socialized medicine, where government does the hospitals and program, there's trust in built in the healthcare system. And the most of the cost of transplants are borne by the government. These are opt-in and opt-out rates in some of these countries. And you see Croatia has an opt, you know, disease donation rate of 34, but a living donation rate of not less 1.7. Italy has a you know organ donation rate of disease for 25 almost, living only six. Luxembourg has no living donation. So Slovenia and Spain, of course, is the leader, 49 disease donation rate, but it's only seven living donation rate. The gentleman who is responsible for the, you know making this happen is Rafael, and he's the one who actually changed the whole system. In around in the year 2000, 2004, by appointing transplant coordinators as ICU physicians who were and supported by nurses, he trained them in organ donation conversation with the family. He also provided hospital reimbursement for donation activity and carried out mass media campaign. And he said the burden of responsibility to raise the question of donations falls on medical professionals to 
few of whom are ever receiving any specific training in the special and dedicated tasks. This is by far the target group which takes an effort to improve our donation rate and must be constant. This was the key of success for Spain to improve the donation rate, especially in disease donation. But if you look at the opt-in countries, we find that the opt-out in the disease donation rate and the living donation rate is more or less balanced. Look at Canada, almost 21 and almost 16. Denmark, similar, almost similar consensus there. So in most of the countries where you have opt-in, the living donation rate and the disease donation rate are similar. Many of these countries don't have the right systems in place in the ICU to even further improve their disease donation rate. In the United States, if you combine both, you know, the living and the disease donation rate, then it could be higher than Spain. Almost come to 58, but Spain will come to about 56 overall. PMP, per million production. So let's next look at challenges and barriers in pushing this program forward. Where are the challenges? I'm bringing this motive, and this I use from my friend, you know, Jeremy Chapman. The program of our organization, you know, has the best of both practices, best of, you know, very noble practices and best of, and the worst of any practice. And here you see the devil, and the angel in the same motif. And this truly represents the, our population in Kathmandu. This challenge for access and equity in distribution across the world. 80% of transplants happen in developed world, where less than 20% of the world population lives. It is estimated that almost two to seven million people die prematurely due to access to treatment, lack of access to treatment for chronic kidney disease. And most of these deaths are happening in developing countries. This is Southeast Asia, a densely populated region. It has now, you know, a, uh, a, a population of over 2 billion people. This is a five years old slide. It is five times the population of the United States. Heavily populated region and a very high incidence of kidney failure. If you look at the global observatory data on this, kidney transplant distribution across the you know, various continents, uh, most of the developed world has a high, have a high rate of transplants, where the developing world, like Africa, Asia, Southeast Asian region, the Mediterranean region, Eastern Mediterranean region, they have a, all have a low donation rate. And this is where most of the population Lives. The poverty index, the, you know, the development, human development index also is, you know, if you look at these Southeast Asian regions, is linked to organ commerce and child labor. You have two kidneys. So the populace, you know, take on this is one to care for and the other to spare. And because of the spare business, what has happened is with technology, with internet, social media, the whole process of organ trafficking is getting increasingly worse, increasingly difficult to control. This transplant tourism started in, you know, India, and it is the mother of medical tourism. As Dr. Bandai was saying in the 80s, Indian surgeons were highly skilled. The cost of transplant was very low in India. So the increase in demand of kidneys made Patients, you know, coming from Middle East, patients came to India and bought kidneys for the poverty-stricken poor people. So they sell them that the rich donated to the poor, very, very few. And this is a study by Bader Goel way back in 2002, which was published in the journal, American Medical Journal. And he surveyed 328 living paid donors from Chennai. And 96% of the participants sold their kidneys to pay off their debt. You know, taken from the loan sharks, and the average amount received was only fifty thousand rupees, or about thousand dollars. And look at this: seventy-five percent of donors were still in debt at the time of the survey, despite having received the money. That this didn't do enough for them. And the conclusion was: after expecting the average family income declined by thirty-three percent, eighty-six percent of donors reported deterioration in their health after nephrectomy, and seventy-nine percent would not recommend others to sell their kidneys. 
So I ask this question very often. What should it actually cost to purchase a kidney? What should be the true value? If you really want the market forces to decide the value of the kidney, what should it be? The only equivalent you have is you know, dialysis. So a normal lifespan of a transplant kidney averages, let's say, 10 years. And if you were to equate the cost of kidney to the cost of dialysis, let's see how it works, how much it will work out. And then you know that at least this is the value of if you wish to purchase a kidney on an international market or whatever. So let's say in India, where the cost of dialysis is rather low, it's about, you know, three dollars, I mean about $15 and $20. Maybe. And if somebody has hemodialysis three times a week, four, 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 you know, in four weeks a month, 12 times you know, in a year, 10 years, the total cost comes to for 5,760 hours of dialysis is, comes to about 2.8 million rupees. This calculation does not include the 24 seven cost of kidney for 10 years, because kidney works 24 seven, it doesn't work only 5,000 hours. So a hemodialysis for 24 hours a day, for 87,000 hours in 10 years, the total cost, even in Indian rupees, comes to about 43 billion rupees. And in US dollar, it will come to more than half a million dollars. And this does not include the cost of investigation, drugs, and cost of access in case of dialysis. So if you really want to put market forces for kidney to buy a kidney, this should be the value of the kidney. If you want to buy a kidney, spend half a million dollars, and maybe you'll get one. This is the true value of the kidney. And that's for only 10 years. So organ commerce devalues altruism because when you donate out of love, out of goodness, the quality of life is much better. But when you donate out of money, as the money runs out, the quality of life comes out. So that it actually brings down your altruism. So the law in most countries makes it illegal to offer any valuable kidney conservation to the donors of the organ. And most laws are, have now given very heavy penalties for organ commerce. In India, if you know doctors can be removed from the register from practice, and they can be fined heavily, almost up to forty thousand dollars, which is quite high in Indian rupees. So, what are the barriers in the society to organ donation? The first issue is religion and cultural barriers. Mostly, this is problem is that organ donation today doesn't happen because many people think it is against the religion and the culture. The second problem is mistrust in the healthcare system, especially where private healthcare flourishes. A country like India, where 90% of transplant happens in private health. And there is a misconception of brain death, not among the public, but also among the doctors. So let's skip this since we will be a little short of time. I'm asking is religion a barrier to organ donation? Okay, carry on. 10 seconds. Is religion a barrier to organ donation? What do you think? So, yes, no. Okay. Let's answer this question. Okay.
So we do this training program as a foundation, and we have a restructured program. This is the only type of training program which is available in this part of the world in this region, which covers four aspects, medical aspects, legal ethical aspects, grief counseling, and transplant coordination. And we started this in 2009. This is, you know, we've trained about 2,600 odd transplant coordinators. We have a one week, one month, one year program and it's supported by some foundations. We also have one year program, which has many modules, video lectures, contact sessions, field visits and so on. And we have an online, you know, e-learning offering. And so far we have trained online, the one year program, 203 from India and 15 from overseas because it's so, you know, well priced, just priced at about $200 for the whole year. And these e-learning courses are available on our, on our site. We have, you know, all these courses which anybody can come and take. And I'll show you the impact of this training of transplant coordinators. We did an MOU with a large government hospital in 2010. And in 10 years, we counseled close to 299 families were identified brain dead. 291 families were opposed for organization. 93 said no, but 198 said yes. And we had a conversion rate of 66%. Just by one program, we had 136 donors who donated 854 organs in tissue. And we also had donation after separate death. So multiple organs were donated by just one hospital, by just providing coordination services. This has not happened before 2010 for them. There's also a story from Rajasthan. We started the transplant registry at free counting services in SMS Medical College in 2014. And if you see a bar here, you see how many donors we had, 42 donors with multiple organs. And, you know, people say that only the educated will donate. Here you have a family from a village in Rajasthan whose loved one donated the organs. And our counselors went to the family during the prayer meet. And this is the family and these are the parents. And what he's saying is, my loved one has not, is not dead. He's living in many people. And this is the perception they have. We also do capacity building for ICU professionals. We run many ICU workshops. We have trained ICU people in organ donation practices, good practices and how to you know, look after brain death. We give them communication exercises, the organ donation pathway we show them. This is a one-day workshop. We also train for organ retrieval. We conduct a master class which where we have a tie-up with Oxford. And every year we do one master class in India in a wet lab in Bangalore, where we don't we 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 uh, you know practice make them practice on cadavers. We have had multiple workshops, and if you see, and due to this workshop, we the impact has been huge. Here we have a surgeon, cardiothoracic surgeon from a government general hospital in Madurai, which is down south. He had never done a heart transplant, never seen one. He came to our workshop, went back, and started doing heart transplant. So, you know, this is an amazing kind of impact of something so simple, doing some training programs and doing some capacity building. We're also taking care of our transport because the Indian, if you're to India, you've seen the traffic is chaotic. And we have managed to convince the police that when there is a organ movement to stop all the traffic on the road to move the organs. And this is in Mumbai. And you see how the traffic is coming hard. And you see how the ambulance will move. So this organ is moving from one hospital to another hospital. And this is the view from inside the van. When you do something good, the public consciousness wakes up and you see how people start putting flowers because the organ is being moved on the van. We've done a lot of public engagement over the years with schools, at rallies, supporting our donations. We've done a lot of these, you know, little skits. This is a mine to promote our donation. These competitions we hold. We work with corporates and we get endorsements from celebrities as well. 
and we promote, of course, our donor card. We have distributed millions of donor cards and we lost count. And what it takes to save life, just a simple signature. Or today, we can also you know, pledge goggles on our driving license. And now many countries, of course, have this mandated choice where you can pledge your organs on your driving license. We also have you know, supported what is called a family donor card, which is very unique. Because when it comes to our donation, in India, it's the family's decision. So if the whole family is there, they will not forget for our donation. So now we are promoting more and more family donor cards. Because if you see the Indian doors again, you know, many families are crazy. Our prime minister also supports our donation, and he, in his one of his talks, talked about how our donation is very important. And that's what brings brought this to the mainstream. All this work over the years has led to increase in disease donation rate in India. In 2012, we only had about 200 donors. In 2016, we had almost you know, 700 odd donors, resulting in so many, many kidneys, rivers, heart, and lungs, and so on. And in about five, six years, our donation rate went up four times. If you look at the global observatory figures again, we do close to 150,000 odd solid organ transplants, as you see here, in the world. Many, of course, most are kidneys, and followed by liver. If you look at the Indian transplant activity, over the years, you see from 2012 to 2013, how this graph has slowly been rising. And some of this contribution has been due to disease donor organs, which have come. We do close to about, you know, Seven to 12,000 kidney transplants. We do close to about 3,000 liver transplants in the world. Which country do you think does the maximum living kidney transplants in the world by numbers? I just have a quick audience poll. I don't know if we can take this. USA, Spain, India, and China. And you, you want to put up the poll? Which country do you think does the maximum living kidney transplant in the world by numbers? Thank you. Some of you got it right. Let me show you. Stop. Let me stop sharing. About 28% said US. 14 said Spain, 48% said India, and 10% said China. So if you look by numbers, India has the largest living kidney transplant program. And today we do many of these programs in programs. The standard way of taking out the kidney is either lat donor nephrectomy, and now few hospitals also start doing robotic, both kidney, not only you know, donor nephrectomies, taking out the kidney, but also transplanting kidneys. At least I know of five centers where we do robotic kidney transplants. This is followed by US and other countries. So Indian program is growing fast. As far as disease donation is concerned, in, if, one, if you take my numbers, India is again in top 10 level. You know, although we do have about 800, 900 disease donors in the world, but by numbers, we may be short on the median population, but by numbers, we are you know, in the top 10 level position. To the liver transplant program, in, in living liver transplant, India does the maximum living liver transplant today in the world. If you combine disease donor and living, and then of course, India is only third, US is right, that's nice. This is a map of India, green is the color of organ donation. I'm putting a ripple, which is green, and this represents organ donation. Many of these color states are now turned green in the country, many more are left in the country. Today we have close to about three to four multi-organ disease donation happening every day. Many NGOs are promoting this program. Not only this, but they also promote corneal donations and blood donation. And if you look at the corneal donation rate in India, 96 families donate corneas on their loved ones during the hospital or during the, you know, eye bank and say, please take the corneas from your loved ones. We have close to 70,000 corneal donations. We have 11 million blood donations happening every day. I'm trying to say this because this program, corneal donation, and blood donation is also a like organ donation and is mostly the NGOs and volunteers for the biggest champions. So to run a successful organ donation program, you need everybody to work together, whether it's your state government, state health department, government, private sector, NGOs, public health. And you know, Mother Teresa said, I can't do what you can do and you can't do what I can do. But together we can do great. And this is what we need to do in our way. We need to work together. 
and we need to take some bold policy decisions. This we published recently in American Journal of Transformation. Bold policy changes are needed to meet the need of our participation. So I'm coming towards the end. How can you help? You help by becoming a volunteer of the program, either with us or anywhere in the world. You become a member of our foundation. You will become a master of the cause, take up an internship with us, take a career path, get trained as transplant coordinators. These are some of our interns from a fashion institute who recently joined. Did some wonderful posters for us just two, three days back. And this is again a short video, which I don't know whether to play. So we have a one day ambassador's program for organization where you can take an online certificate course from organization and become an ambassador of the program. And it covers basic concepts, body donation, legal aspects, and so on. And at the end of it, there's an interaction with a group of you know, doctors and others, and then you go on to become an ambassador. So you can take up this and get knowledgeable and get empowered with the whole concept of organization. We just started this during the time of COVID. And this was about three or four months back. And we're already having many candidates to take the program and gone back successfully in the society to create more awareness and more to do more work. And this, of course, all our presentations are dedicated to organ donor families. These are some organ donor families way back in 1999. This is me here. Quite young when I came back to India from England, and these are 63 year old families. We honored them in 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 a college in Chennai, and we put a lot of trees there, and we put a plaque here. And recently, last year, we put this Angadatta Smarak. This is in you know, dedication to the organ donors of the country. This is in Jaipur, in front of the hospital, and this is again dedicated to the organ donors, who are the true heroes. Of the whole program, our donors. You would have our relation. If you have time, I want to read this legacy of Robert and Ed. He reads, gives the full story of our relation. This will take me two minutes. Am I okay for time, Dr. Bandari? Yes, 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 please go ahead. Okay. Please go ahead. Thank you. And he, he captures the whole essence of our relation very beautifully. And he says in his legacy, which was written in 1976, at a certain moment, a doctor will determine that my brain has ceased to function and that for all intents and purposes, my life has stopped. When that happens, don't call this my deathbed, call it my bed of life and let my body be used by others to lead through the life. Give my blood to the teenager who has been pulled from the wreckage of his car so that he might live to see his grandchildren play. Give my eyes to a man who has never seen sunrise, a baby's face or love in the eyes of a woman. Give my kidneys to the one who depends on a machine to exist for week to week. Give my heart to a person whose own heart has caused nothing but endless days of pain. Explore every corner of my brain, take my cells, and let them grow so that someday a speechless boy will shout to the crack of a bat, and a deaf girl will hear the sound of rain against her window. Take my bones, every muscle, every fiber, and every nerve from my body. Find a way to make a crippled child walk. Learn what is left of me and scatter the ashes to the wind to help the flowers grow. If you must bury something, let it be my faults, my weaknesses, and all my prejudice against my fellow men. If you do what I've asked, I'll live forever. And this is the story of our nation. This is my team. We have offices in almost nine locations today. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry if I took a little long. I hope I have given you as much as I could in the half, half now, 45 minutes, 40 minutes I've taken. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sunil. Um, uh, incredible work. Congratulations to you and Mohan Foundation. My question is, uh, you are uh, at the foundation, are you maintaining registries, including outcome majors from these centers? How long do you keep contact with them? So I'll tell you, we know all the organ donors, deceased donors of the country, many donors, not all, many donors. As far as the recipient outcome is concerned, we have a national body today, which is called NOTO, which has got a mandate to look at the outcome. And they have formed a registry on the national front. 
data is being gathered, efforts are being made to look at outcome. We have outcomes which are being reported from the hospitals, but we don't have necessarily national outcomes or state outcomes. Yeah, because I think uh, we are geared to follow UNOS the data, which is one of the strongest data uh, bases out there. And I'm sure you would have worked with UNOS and uh, really treat to watch uh, how meticulous every center regulatory wise has to be. You have British uh, data also and India is uh, definitely. And now I think um, uh, I would um, uh, let uh, Shivam come in and uh, give his comment. Thank you, Shivam. I'm sorry that uh, Dr. Bandari could not make it, but uh, Nonetheless, Dr. Shivam Priyadarshi is a professor and head of urology research center, which is at my alma mater, SMS Medical College, Jaipur, one of the largest hospitals, 6,000 beds or something. So, so yeah, attached hospitals would be almost more than 8,000 if you yeah. consider all the 10 so attached Shivam, hospitals. Over to yeah. you, please uh, give a brief so that then we can answer the yeah. questions. Thank you, Dr. Mahindra Bhandari. It is a real uh, privilege and honor to be uh, here today. Uh, Dr. Bhandari has not only been a teacher to us, he, he was my examiner also in the final urology exam. Uh, he did the first live renal transplant in our department way back in 1994. I, I vividly remember the day I was a resident at that time, uh, and uh, Dr. Bhandari and Dr. Rajesh Agarwal, he was a resident at that time with him. He came, and Dr. S. C. Mathur was head of the department at that time. And I remember vividly the transplantation program that started in our medical college at that time. So thank you very much, Dr. Bhandari. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sunil Shroff. Uh, you have been a crusader in our country for organ donation. and. Definitely, you have been a very instrumental figure in starting the cadaveric transplant program in our uh, own medical college and department of virology, you and uh, the Mohan Foundation. So thank you very much. And thanks a lot for your wonderful deliberation on organ donation. So uh, I now thank Dr. Sudhir Bhandari, our principal and controller, SMS Medical College. He is working day in and day out for the development and upliftment of our college and hospital. And in his leadership, we have been able to continue our cadaveric donation program, though it has, uh, uh, so can I share my screen? I have been disabled. So can I ask the host to, can I ask, yeah. So I will just uh, share a small presentation. Uh, this presentation is on behalf of our uh, principal and controller, uh, Dr. Sudhir Bhandari. Uh, we know uh, there is an acute crisis of organs in our country. There's a discrepancy between the need of organs and the transplants uh, done in our country today. Rajasthan, though, lags behind uh, multiple states but still it is in one of the first 10 of the states uh, who are running the cadaveric program in the country at present. So we started our, our cadaveric transplant program in February 2015 uh, with uh, help of the political will. The government really was bent upon starting the cadaveric program. Uh, there was enthusiasm in the administration and definitely uh, people like Dr. Sunil Shroff and Mohan Foundation and other organizations who helped us to start the cadaveric program uh, in our college. So. Uh, we have not, uh, uh, we, the academic program is still continuing uh, only because in the last one year, because of the COVID, uh, we have slowed down a little bit, but till now we have done 52 cadaveric renal transplants in our own uh, department. Uh, we have started even uh, liver transplants and cardiac transplants. So the credit goes to the leadership of our principal and controller, Sudhir Mandari, who has initiated this liver transplant program and cardiac transplant program in our medical college, the first time in the state. So uh, 
there have been a lot of challenges uh, in the process of starting this cadaveric transplant program. As uh, Dr. Sunil Shaw said, there, the main issue is the religious and cultural background, which creates a, a kind of a reluctancy uh, to the relatives to donate organs of the deceased donor. And besides this, there were many ethical, moral, financial, and administrative issues that had to be overcome. So uh, we had overcome uh, the bureaucratic barrier uh, by taking a lot of initiatives, by uh, creating, uh, by minimizing these hurdles, by again uh, creating a lot of uh, new things, the waiver of NOC, uh, single table clearance, and the creation of the uh, green corridors. And then it involved a lot of training also, training of uh, the doctors, our surgeons, uh, physicians, and uh, uh, awareness amongst uh, not only masses, but also uh, we had programs in schools and children going on, and definitely the NGOs, which uh, came to our support in a big way. So the stakeholders involved not only the donor, or the recipient, the doctors and the hospital, but it also involves uh, the traffic police, the CISF, the airlines, the airport authority, police, etc., who are actually helping us to create the green corridors for transporting the organs. In our own medical college, we established the Soto Center in, the, in 2019 in our academic block in SMS Medical College, and it is one of the best and state-of-the-art center uh, in our place. So under the leadership of our principal, we have been able to achieve a lot in the last few years. We have been able to donate excess of bodies to our own our different medical colleges in the states. We have been able to save more than 130 lives by transplanting uh, the organs from cadaveric donors. Uh, we have been able to create awareness amongst the masses by uh, having more than 10,000 donation places. Uh, I remember as a secretary of the North Zone Urological Society of India, in every conference and meeting, we used to have a donation pledge. And we had to use, we used to have some kind of program for cadaveric donation. So uh, in last two, three years, uh, we have been able to initiate the liver and heart transplant program also in our medical college. And being a state government hospital, the cost of surgery is minimal. And the availability has also been increased in the last few years. There have been a few suggestions from our side to the state government that organ donation should be a part of the medical curriculum. And there should be a compulsory sharing of information about death in ICU. There should be a centralized list of recipients among city hospitals. And there should be a health insurance coverage to the at least two family members uh, of the relatives of the deceased who have donated. There should be a streamlining of the system of unclaimed body donation. The government hospital should be given priority in receiving the organs. Uh, swap transplantation should be encouraged, and the close relatives of donors should get priority over others. So these were a few suggestions, and this was our short journey. It's still miles to go, but uh, this small challenging journey is the reward that we have got. So I thank you for your patient hearing. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Shiva. It's a really incredible job. And uh, Sunil, uh, one point we should not forget, the organ transplant helps, as you and Shivam said, large masses, but it helps to improve the standard of care in a hospital. Absolutely. When I enter a hospital, if I know there is a successful liver transplant or bone marrow transplant, immediately I get a message. Absolutely. That what level of laboratory service or microbial service or blood transfusion or blood product service or infrastructure would be there. That you should not forget. I think uh, government should take it as a leverage to uplift the standard of care in a hospital by introducing organ transplantation. So I think, Sunil, we can take questions from the box. And there are a few so. questions. And um, uh, Shivam, you stay on. Thank you very much for an 11th hour thing and uh, we are very very happy that you have been able to take the lead i will just make a small comment on what you said about the leverage uh, 
after that organ uh, cadaveric donation only we got those our open theaters modular by the state government so we could create modular theaters and soon we will be shifting to a very state of the art block which is called super speciality block and we will have urology and the uh, gastroenterology and nephrology people in that block and it will be a wonderful uh, block uh, it's one of the best probably amongst the state government hospitals in the country Oh, I, I look forward I to, to visit you. you there. Sorry. Sorry. I Sorry. look forward to visit you there. Yeah. Yes. So we, we, we put the seed in your minister's mind of having a transplant institute. At the very beginning, when we were working in SMS Medical College, the counselors were working, and we told that health, second, health minister at that time, Mr. Rajkot, that you must have a transplant institute, sir, in Rajasthan, which will cater to all transplants. And we seeded the idea in his mind, and I think it did work. And luckily, last, in my last visit, I saw that the institute is coming up so well. And I wish you all the very best for this program. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. So, Dr. Madari, I interrupted you. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, I think you can take questions from the question sure. box. I will. And, uh, you can answer those questions. And So the one question is, can a cancer patient donate his healthy organs if uh, he or she died? Thank you. This is James from Manila. So James, uh, yes, you can, uh, cancer patients can donate. There are certain cancers which you cannot donate. Brain you know, tumors, brain cancer patients can donate. But there are certain cancers, if there's metastasis and so on, then they will not be eligible for donation. Uh, then again, skin, some skin cancers, are, you can allow, are allowed to donate. And if there is a period of, let's say a cancer has been treated and the patient has been cancer free for five years, then it is only a relative contraindication to donate. So gross you know, metastasis will not be eligible, but some cancers will be eligible. So there is no you know, one answer to this. Second question is from Poonam Gulati. She says, for a female, married female, who should be the one to give consent? As a donor, she should give the consent. And if she's married and you know doesn't have children, I'd be a little hesitant to ask for a consent in that situation because the instance of preeclampsia could be high in certain studies. So, in so, if a married female, and unfortunately, again talking about equity and distribution, for the world, including India, women donate more than men. And in our own hospital, when I did a study, there was 65% women who donated compared to 35% men. And there are some, you know, centers I know where 80% of women who are donating. So when a married woman is donating and gives a consent, a counseling is required, a support is required to make sure there's no coercion, there's no pressure on that woman to donate. You know, unfortunately, that is the situation. And we need to change this gender you know, distribution of equity in transplantation. Very much required. And I'm sure Dr. Bandari would feel the same. Dr. Bandari, would you want to say something on this? Yeah, I would like you to really elaborate and discuss this point because this always be faced that this male chauvinism, male's family, invariably the husbands don't agree that the wives give donor organs. They are grown up. They are independent. There should be gender equality to the father or the sister. So I think you, I would like you to use this platform to say that males should stay within their rights of the Indian constitution, that females have a right, and they should really accept it because um, how the spousal donation is welcome. If the, no. the, 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 the most intimate donor is the wife and they gladly accept. But if the wife wants to give, I know so many families, as you would know, that they had almost to the level of breakup and then the transplant team has to come into and counsel these people. So I think this is a forum we should really emphasize by telling that uh, this, the, 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 once you marry somebody as a female, that she doesn't become your property. She herself has a right as an individual. Absolutely. And there are situations where a woman has been shown to be a wife when she's not. 
just it's a marriage of convenience to show her as a wife and sometimes marriage happens because of convenience to get a transplant and we have to be very careful especially in this program where there's such a huge kind of discrepancy and the gender imbalance that this exploitation doesn't take place many times it happens mothers will come forward sisters will come forward and wives will come forward these are the three most common you know donors we find in india and many parts of the world and as you said dr bandari this is not an easy problem to solve they said that the husband, the male is the breadwinner and that's why you know the the the, the challenge is that you know if they're not out of work you know if there is a loss of work then there is loss of wages whereas the women is able to you know not have that kind of problem many times but things are changing now with you know now things are changing and especially with you know access of you know the surgery itself being minimally invasive that donor nephrectomy has literally i think 80% of you know transplants today done in india at least and many other parts of the world are done by the minimally invasive scars so getting back to work is not a challenge anymore so we need to look at really addressing this gender imbalance in this program you know to overcome this gender imbalance is not going to be easy it will take time i suspect but i also want to put one point forward out of bandari here i don't know somewhere god you know plays his own games when it comes to disease donation 76% of disease donors are men but they are the people who die in rotary reaction to donate i know this is not the yeah you know, this is i don't know i am just saying Somewhere along the way, you know, the God sees it and says, "Okay, I would have corrected it in my own way, perhaps." You know, it's a very silly answer to give, but I'm just saying that there is a huge gender imbalance in this world. I think, uh, Sunil, uh, I would like to narrate a brief personal experience which really made me gender equal advocate. That when I was doing my urology. in 72 at cmc velour the transplant program was new in a in a dialysis unit we were following a potential donor and he was end stage uh, disease guy and the parents would talk to me and suddenly he was doing well and they wanted two days leave to go to uh, tirupati and we couldn't say no or they come back and get a dialysis done and this guy comes and when i go to, on the rounds i see a newly wedded bride standing there <laughs> and i was totally pale that he married that that and this guy believe me all the parents left in laws left and the only lady who was there who came and said where could she sell these ornaments to keep the guy who ever the lady who ever enjoyed the wedded wedlock so i think uh, these kind of stories really make us very humble to be kinder to females and i think i am i'm so happy that this point any other question you have on this thing uh, uh, does the life of a kidney donor become risky in case the donor any time in his life should encounter some kidney disease also liver transplant safe if we concern about its multiple important functions so let me answer this kidney donor story for you so when we do actually an assessment of uh, this is this question is from wajiha urus i'm not sure where he is or she is from Oh, yeah we have 70 50 to 70 countries participate so. okay great thank you thank you ahija for asking this question so the life when we assess a donor we do a very thorough job of assessment of the donor and in fact in many studies it's been seen that a donor is more healthier than a normal population because if he is not healthy enough then the donation will not happen having said that the increasing incidence of lifestyle diseases of hypertension and you know as i showed diabetes if you know a donor donates when they are young let's say in their 20s they are still you know liable towards getting this diabetes hypertension which can increase the risk for kidney disease so yes long term risk have been quantified there is a very big study from us done by a gentleman who looked at 85000 donors in the us and he came to the conclusion that there is no increased risk uh, of kidney disease compared to normal population and if you want i can send you uh, a paper of, i mean i can send you the uh, paper on this uh, on this study but there are not many such studies from countries asian countries like india we don't have any long term data on kidney donors we don't have data of 20 25 years because once somebody donates 
very difficult to follow the path. So that's why it is so very important that there should be more disease donation, whether this risk to the living donor is little less. In, I must emphasize, a donor is thoroughly investigated, and in our best of ability, we try to make sure that only healthy people are donating to a person who requires a kidney. The second question is, is liver transplant safe? Yes, living liver transplant has its concerns, and there is a higher mortality among living donors. And many, many countries like US, many programs have been suspended because they've had donor deaths, which is unacceptable because a donor is not a patient. A donor is donating out of love and altruism. And as a doctor, you know, when I take my Hippocratic oath, I say that I will take care of the sick, not necessarily of a healthy person. Yes, there are some risks for a liver donor, but you need to discuss those risks. What we find is when a adult donates to a child where only the left lobe of the liver is taken, then the risks are very, very big. So that is the best kind of combination. And we have, you know, biliary cirrhosis in young kids who require liver transplant. And many times the mother gives a part of the liver and it goes beautifully well. So again, you know, it requires a little bit more discussion. And so this is my answer to you. Uh, what is the main challenge of organ donation in COVID-19 condition? So this question comes from Yash Jaiswal. So in COVID-19, the do donation rate in India has come down almost less than half of what we used to do. We do on an average about, you know, eight to 900 donations in a year. In 2020, we only did about 350 to 400 donations. So we have had a lot of challenges because hospital beds have been filled by COVID. And to do a transplant in a COVID patient, to do a transplant even in a normal patient, we have to do an RT-PCR test. We have to make sure that the donor and the recipient are negative for COVID before we actually can transplant them. And this test needs to be repeated immediately before transplant, needs to be done twice. And you know there are risks, of course, uh, to the staff as well. You know, when we are taking care of certain all these transplants, because as you know, the COVID, COVID can be a very silent kind of, uh, you know, infection as well. You know, some patients may not even have the symptoms of COVID, but they still may be carrier. So COVID is very challenging. Every country is finding, finding this uh, very challenging. It's not an easy, but we do have guidelines which have been published on our website, on the ISOD website, on the national websites, and on the American websites, if you want to do a transplant during COVID. That answers some of these questions, Dr. Bandari. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's take advantage of Shivam being here. Uh, Shivam, uh, one point I want to clarify through this platform. As Sunil said, that donor globally is taken as a zero tolerance surgery. It's not acceptable that donor should have, you know, even that 0.003% mortality globally. Uh, can you assure the potential donors that, uh, how do you really assure them that, because this is a common question to the family, that uh, whether uh, donor would be safe or not? So, uh, yes, definitely we need to counsel the family. And usually what we say that, see, uh, there are so many people who are born with one kidney. And they are born with one kidney and they live their life totally comfortably and without any problem. So uh, it is uh, not a great uh, risk to uh, donate a, a kidney. So even if you have one kidney, who, which is very healthy kidney, uh, there is almost a very good chance that you will live your life uh, uh, almost the same way. So uh, this is the usual counseling that we do. And uh, definitely the studies have also shown. And so we, uh, if there is a, somebody who is educated, we will just tell them about the studies which show that uh, it doesn't make much of a difference, a very, very minor difference uh, if one donates one kidney and uh, lives without, if, the, if he doesn't have any other comorbidity. If the, the patient is perfectly healthy, otherwise, then definitely it doesn't make much of a difference. So this is the way usually we counsel. Thank you, Shivam. And I think, yeah, we have an international consensus statement by Amsterdam Forum, where we put a you yeah. know consensus on who can donate and who can't donate. It's a very well 
kind of you know published document and many yeah, of us we, we were those part those of it, we were part of that and we were part of that lisbon also the international transport lisbon also ID. and kidgo kidgo as well in us so we follow those guidelines you in india yeah yeah i know yeah yeah i was there thank you very much uh, sunil uh, if there is nothing i'll give it back to dev for thank you shivam for showing up and you, it was a wonderful thank discourse you. thank you shivam thank you and uh, thank dev you, back you. to you thank you dev what a, what a, an exciting program to see i've long been a kidney or, or, or organ donor advocate if you can see my driver's license i have my heart in the corner of my driver's license and so I want to say I'm also a blood donor. I've wow, donated 13 and a half gallons. So I, wow. I agree. I, I do have, you know, one short video I would like to show just to give our audience an idea of what it's like to be in an operating room when an organ is donated. I was, I videoed this about five years ago. So if I could show you this, it's only a minute long. Yeah, it's called RKT in a minute. This is a robotic kidney transplant. Kidney's in the room. can see at the very end that before they even took the patient out of the room, the donated kidney was functioning. So thank you, Dr. Shroff, for the work that you do. And Dr. Priya Darshi, thank you for being here today. It's rather thank impressive. You. Too. Thank you. Dave, I want to share my uh, donor card, uh, driving <laughs> license as well. You can see my organ donor on my license as well. Like I, yours. I saw that. So we, share, we share something common. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> well, thanks again for being here to all our attendees. And gentlemen, thank you for the time you spent thank this you. evening. Thank you, Dr. Batali.